Just two hours after Humani Vitae II was published, a number of cardinals denied that it had been written by the Pope. A statement was issued by the Pope's secretary confirming that Pope John John had indeed been the author of Humani Vitae II. Some cardinals denied that the Pope's secretary had issued the statement confirming that Pope John John had written Humani Vitae II. A somewhat agitated representative of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith suggested to journalists that there had been some minor errors made by clerks responsible for copying the documents, uh, the document, and that it would have been um, it would have to have been would have to be withdrawn so the corrections could be made. But half an hour later, Pope John John told reporters personally that there had been no clerks involved. He had written the whole thing himself with an H. B. pencil. To reinforce this fact, he drew the pencil from the breast pocket of his cassock and showed it to the cameras. Cardinal Phillips remained unconscious. Word of Human Eye 2 spread across uh, Human Eye Vitae 2 spread across the world, and images of the HP pencil and Pope John John's finger pointing at it appeared on the front pages of newspapers and on TV. Edgar Malroy saw the pencil on the evening news. Sophia Alderson, soon after receiving her latest visitation from the Holy Mother of God, placed the red mark she had been saving for the end of the world on her wall chart. At the first opportunity, Sophia Alderson uh, told Dr. Cunningham that the end of the world was coming. Dr. Cunningham uh, didn't hear what Sophia was saying. He was staring into her ridiculously beautiful eyes and thinking about his clipboard, which he had left in his office by mistake. Sophia Alderson was the last patient Dr. Cunningham would ever have. She was also, of course, the most beautiful. Pretty soon, the group of protesters outside Rainthorpe House, with their illegible placards and I've put my money where my metaphysics are badges, heard the news that Sophia Alderson had been told the date for the end of the world. They nodded and said, told you so. They believed, you see that Sophia Alderson was God's messenger, etc., etc. Was she? Who knows? While all this was going on, I was trying to scale the Coomba Icefall at the base of the western face of Everest. No easy task for a supermarket trolley. As my ridiculous little wheel slipped, and I skidded all over the place, I thought about the ontological proof of God. Existence according to the proof was part of the ingredients that went into making the Supreme Being. Surely, though, existence wasn't a property but a state, not something in a thing, but a, but a state a thing is in. The concept of God was no different if there was such an entity in existence or if there wasn't. The number of metaphysical bets made uh, grew and grew. A small army of entrepreneurs set up uh, stalls outside the metaphysical betting shops, uh, selling all manner of refreshments, including tangerines, to the constantly growing um, queues of nuts. Everyone seemed to want to make at least one bet. It became something of a craze. The number of lottery tickets uh, sold started to go down. Everyone bragged about their metaphysical assertions, and anyone who didn't sport an I've put my money where my metaphysics are badge was considered a social outcast. People began to show off their metaphysical bets in specially manufactured albums available from the metaphysical betting shops uh, for a quite ridiculous price. On the cover of the albums was a giant question mark. Anyone who made over 100 bets, each worth in excess of £100, was awarded a golden I've put my money where my metaphysics are badge. Every bishop in the Church of England soon possessed such a badge, as did the leaders of over 30 major religions. Parents began making bets for their children. Will stated posthumous bets, invariably about the final destinations of the deceased. The Times printed bets in their personal column in between births and deaths. Priests bet on their sermons. Billboards everywhere asked, have you put your money where your metaphysics are today? 
and Edgar's TV ads appeared at least six times a night. As everyone had expected, uh, for there would have been riots otherwise, Edgar was given permission to start building his new offices in Jerusalem and California. Work started almost immediately. Edgar planned to expand as rapidly as he could. He told his staff and shareholders that he wanted to have a metaphysical betting shop within walking distance of every nut in the world. He said that he didn't want any nut to believe something metaphysical without being able to put money on it. I want them to think Edgar Malroy whenever they think something nutty, something metaphysical, and reach for their wallets. That was it, he said, his goal. He told this to reporters. He also told reporters of his plans to build a 400 metre high tower in the centre of London. The tower, to be called Skeptic Tower, would be by far the tallest building in the capital and was to be the central headquarters of Edgar's growing worldwide metaphysical betting empire. Plans for the tower were quickly drawn up and work on the foundations began almost immediately in the heart of London, next to the Bank of England. Edgar wanted Skeptic Tower shaped like a question mark. Around the same time as plans for the Skeptic Tower were released, representatives of Skepticism Inc. began t uh, buying up uh, surplus stocks of powdered milk, wheat and butter from the United States and Europe. Edgar Malroy then spent in excess of £10 million buying up old cargo ships which were used to transport the surplus food to starving children in Africa and India. Each of Edgar Malroy's ships was painted white and had giant question marks on its bow and bow and stern. <laughs>